Welcome to Alta Banking, a business podcast for everyone interested in elevating their financial future. I'm your host, Stan Sorensen, and together we're going to hear interviews, information, and insights for making great financial decisions for your business. Today, I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Ryan Jones, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Lending Officer at Alta Bank. Uh, Ryan, welcome. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. It's great. Um, and we're going to be talking about all things commercial real estate, from construction to lending. How you doing, Ryan? Good. Good. How are good. you, Stan? I'm great. Thanks. Good to have you here. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, let's get started with talking a little bit about your background, uh, you know, talk about how you got into banking, and let, let's talk about your role at, at Alta Bank, too. I'm not sure if everybody knows what a commercial lending officer does. Yeah, I mean, it's the it's the standard joke in the industry, right, that no one chooses to be in banking. And uh, it, it's the accidental career, and, and that's, you know, probably true to a large degree for me as well. It's uh, you find yourself finishing up college, and all of a sudden you got uh, a young family started, and uh, you just have a friend that's in banking, and you take a job just thinking it'll be great to help you get through school. And, you know, 20 years later, here you are in banking. So uh, still here, yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, twenty plus years in the, in the industry. Sixteen years at Alta Bank, uh, chief lending officer, as we define it. Uh, I, I, ha- I run commercial banking, so we're looking, you know, focusing on businesses. My teams are focusing on businesses, kind of ten million plus in revenue, um, and we seek to go out and just provide great value through expertise, great products, lending products, deposit products, treasury products. And uh, really try to take great care of those clients. Yeah. So you used a phrase with me. Well, you've used it with me a few times as we as we sit down and talk. Where you know we talk about Alta Bank wanting to be the best bank for your business. You like to use the phrase the best bankers for your business. So talk a little about that. Yeah. No. Great question. And 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 yeah. As we worked through the uh, you know through the rebrand project that we mm-hmm. we went through and then came up with the best bank for your business is our mission statement, our vision statement. Uh, it really came to me, uh, how do we deliver that? And we deliver it by providing the best bankers for your business. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in an industry, sometimes it can feel a little bit commoditized product-wise. The differentiator is is that banker. A- and having a banker that understands financial metrics, that understands markets and what, what what's going on, uh, that's where you can really have a banker that comes in and is a, 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 valued, uh, a real value add in terms of not only connecting you with a product, but really helping you think through what product might be the right one for your business at any given time. And, and that's what we really aim to deliver at Alta Bank is, is bankers that really sit down and provide great value because they're experts at what they do, not just yeah. because they kind of facilitate the issuance of a product. Yeah. Yeah. And it's working, which is fantastic. Um, all right. So let's, let's kind of jump into some of the you know, some of the, the, the detailed stuff we want to talk about. Let's start off by talking a little bit about commercial construction. And I was hoping that what we could do uh, is start off by defining it, at least how we think about it at, at Alta Bank, because that might be something that, yeah. that helps uh, our clients and potential clients. And then give me your read on the state of the industry right now. Sure. Uh, yeah, so when we talk commercial construction, typically there, there's four major asset classes that, that uh, we discussed there, and that would be uh, office space, uh, retail space, so you know places where people go to shop. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we would talk a lot about industrial or warehouse type space. You know, you think more fulfillment centers where things are stored or housed in transit. Uh, and then the final one that sometimes is a little surprising is multifamily is actually considered hmm. commercial construction. So for rent uh, residential properties uh, mm-hmm. fit into that commercial construction category as well. And so those are the four main ones. And then obviously you have little niches that come off of that as well. Sure. So, uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, hospitals, uh, hotels, assisted living centers, storage units are all kind of these little yeah. niche kind of offshoots, right, that, that get lumped in there yeah. as well, but but don't maybe have a place in one of those four major categories. Mm-hmm. So, And then we'll even talk a lot about, you know, residential construction, uh, you know, single family homes, which, you know, technically isn't commercial construction. But it's really kind of that bellwether. I mean, you typically watch that residential construction market 
uh, to see patterns that you can start to expect often mm -hmm. in the commercial market a year or two down the road. So a lot of times residential becomes that, uh, you know, canary in the coal mine or that, that, yeah. uh, that, indi that, that leading indicator of yeah. what might happen on the commercial side. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll take some time to talk about that a yeah. little bit, right? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's an important topic and it's one that a lot of people are interested in. So we'll definitely take some time to talk about that. If I look across all of those major categories, at least, how are we looking this year? You know, after, especially after yeah. last year, which, you know, nobody could predict any of what was going to happen. Yeah, so if, if you look at it globally, you know, I think a lot of people know that, that through the pandemic, Utah really didn't lose that many jobs. We're, uh, I think our unemployment's only up just a, a, a few, you know, like a eight-tenths or something like that. Yeah. And, and so there are industries, obviously, through the pandemic uh, that were hurt. Um, you think of hospitality and some of these retail areas, right? And you start to say, okay, if, if there's so many losses there, then why are we even? And, and construction is why we're even. So construction jobs are up about 10% through mm -hmm. the pandemic. And so if you look kind of big picture globally, how are we looking from a construction standpoint? Really fantastic. We've seen a ton of construction activity here. Uh, it really didn't slow down uh, through you know, the, the challenges of the last year. Now that said, you may have heard this term, uh, a K-shaped recovery, mm -hmm. and, and economists have kind of coined this term, um, looking at the, the impact of the pandemic and saying, okay, that kind of creates this pivot point, and there are businesses that recovered quickly or even were benefited by the, the pandemic, right? And that's the upper side of this K, right? Yeah. But then the lower side is you have some of these businesses that were really challenged by the pandemic. And you see that uh, in the real estate, the commercial real estate world uh, everywhere, and particularly here in Utah. So when you think through things like industrial and warehouse space, yep. uh, you start to think of you know the Amazon economy and having large warehouses where things can be stored and shipped and this, this logistical fulfillment can occur, right? Yeah. And, and that space is just crazy demand for it as fast as it gets built it, it it gets leased up and so when you look at the data there you're seeing um you know stable vacancy vacancy is actually a touch higher but that's only because there's been so much investment in this mm -hmm. and but as soon as it comes on market it leases up lease rates are increasing yeah and, and so you know that's on that upper end of the k similar multifamily housing i mean we've had a well-documented housing shortage i think you had natalie in here the last time you did this natalie right, Bachner, yeah. and you know, and she's kind of been one of the leading folks on that, documenting that housing shortage we've had. You know, you look at Utah, you look at uh, the, we've had great net in migration. Yeah. Uh, we have a high natural rate of, of, of reproduction. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the 2020 census and the last 10 years, 2010 to 2020, Utah was the fastest growing state in the nation. Right. And we're struggling to get all these people in homes. Mm hmm um, I don't know that there's official data yet. You might know, but it appears that the pandemic actually increased net immigration to Utah, and and kind of heightened this housing pressure we have. Right? Yeah. So so just very similar to that warehouse space, you're seeing multifamily space as soon as it comes out of the ground and is available to rent, it's renting. You're seeing lease rates go up. If you're trying to rent an apartment right now, mm -hmm. you're feeling that. Um, yeah. And, and so the you're you're seeing just really great activity there. Yeah. Um, if you were to look at retail space, you know, and initially you might say, well, that, that had to be the hardest hit. Um, the interesting thing about retail, though, is that they've been preparing for this moment. Obviously, they didn't know, right. you know, something it, as it, acute. It was going to hit them that hard. As the that pandemic. Fast, yeah. But you saw three to four years ago, you saw rising vacancy in the retail space. Right. And you saw the market adjust to, one, deliver less of that to the market, mm -hmm. and two, to start shifting to tenants that are kind of resistant to the internet economy, food, mm -hmm. cell phone providers, um, those types of things that, that right. are a little tougher to, mattress stores, that are a little mm -hmm. tougher to order off the internet, right? Right. And, and so they've been making this transition for years, and while it sped them up, they were probably a little more prepared for this. And so mm -hmm. um, for years now, you've seen very modest retail growth. There hasn't been a lot of investment there because they've been making this transition. Right, yeah. So because of that, because they weren't too far out over their skis, the pandemic didn't have a, a, a huge impact there. Office space is the one that's that's really been challenged by this. And, and obviously, as you look at work from home, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of companies uh, wondering if they can do work from home for a long time and start saving on real estate costs. 
Uh, employees seem to generally like work from home. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a tight labor market, and so employers are having to contemplate, okay, can we provide this as a long-term solution? Um, I don't know what the ultimate you know, change will be there, but even if it's a 5 to 6% switch to full-time work from home, that will have a pretty big impact on commercial real estate and office space in particular. Yeah. So you are seeing office vacancy. There are pockets where it's better than others in the state, but on the average, you're seeing office vacancy 16, 17, 18 percent, which is quite high. Yeah, yeah. You know, that on, on the office space, there are a couple of interesting points. I mean, number one, you know, we're, as you and I have talked about when we were not, you know, as we were preparing to, to have this conversation, a lot of the measurement of, of construction momentum right now is in the number of building permits that are taken mm -hmm. out. And we both know that it, just because you get a project permit, it doesn't mean that it's under construction or even right. being completed. Um, but when you think about the the fact that, you know, we have the 17% vacancy rate, you know, through April of this year, we've got 49 permits for new office space. Um, I don't know exactly. That's statewide. Yeah. You know, so I, I don't know where exactly it is. Um, but it kind of seems like a bit of a disconnect there. If, if you've got this, high, you know, this, high, this fairly high yeah. vacancy rate and you're still building new offices. I mean, there's got to be some reason why those two things are, are happening like that. Yeah, as you presented that data to me, I, I was kind of speechless for a minute, mm -hmm. which uh, for me is a little bit odd. But uh, <laughs> I, I don't know entirely the answer. I, I do think as you look at some of the things we're working on at the bank, I mean, we are looking at, at some office projects, but yeah. they're all pre-leased. Um, and mm -hmm. so there still are companies that are growing that want to have office space. Right. And so they're either pre-leased or we're building, we're actually building the building for the, the, the business themselves. It's not being done right. for investment or speculation. So yeah. But my guess is, and, and, and again, we, we've talked a little bit about this because they show permits and they show value, right. and we're not quite sure what that value data is mm -hmm. on that on that ivory report. But, yeah. but kind of thinking through that, permits are up a hair, but the value was way, way, way down. Right. So I think what you're still seeing, the bulk of those are, are smaller, what we would call owner-occupied type projects. Oh, yeah. um, that are still being built, and and that makes sense. They're not speculating that that's not impacting the vacancy number, yeah. you know, per se. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it is interesting. You know, the other piece of it too, and we, and we don't need to spend a lot of time on it today. But this whole notion of getting people back to work, and and not only do we need less office space, but how can we or should we be utilizing the office space that we have differently? Right, and there's a whole discipline out there now that you're starting to see in architecture firms and all that, that are, that are all around that workspace planning. And there, are, you know, University Stanford just released this big study about, you know, the and I can't remember exactly what they call it, but it has something to do with utilizing your office space differently, not necessarily giving it up. Yeah. So it'll be yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. Yeah, I think there will be some friends. Again, the first one is just how much of the workforce is going to shift to to work from home. I think will be interesting to watch. I think it'll be interesting to see people's different people's attitudes. I, uh, you know, I went to one of the jazz games. Mm. And hopefully, that's not too soon to have a jazz reference. Not but quite, but we're, we're that, that was a, little, a tough night. It was last a tough night. night. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I went to one of the jazz games with the full. You know, probably the second game they had with a full crowd, right? And, yeah. And I remember going and 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 I'm almost thinking. <sighs> Do I want to be in a building with eighteen thousand of my closest friends? Mm -hmm. You know, and and uh, you know, even though you know I, I'm vaccinated and different things, it, it still was a little bit odd to think I just haven't been in an environment like that for so long. Yeah. And, and are there people that will be hesitant? Now, ultimately, I got in there and they introduced the starting lineup, and I reverted right back to two yeah. years ago pretty easily. But good. But there could be people yeah. that you know have hesitancy for different reasons mm -hmm. to come back. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because as we've talked to some of our employees, the most common response is, well, I'd like to work from home two days or three days a week, and I'd like to work from the office two or three days a week, mm -hmm. um, which I understand the appeal of that. As a, as a business owner, it's a little tricky to say, well, how do we support and staff and right. how do you set up a home and then provide space at work as well? Yeah. So, but, but you're right. That'll be, so do you start looking at more hotel office space where where maybe someone doesn't have a dedicated office right. or a dedicated space, but uh, you start setting up schedules to allow people to have this hybrid work schedule. Mm -hmm. um, I think that'll for sure um, be things that come into play, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it will be. And, uh, you know, as long, as long as there's not this loss of productivity, 
You know, I think that the hybrid model is probably here to stay, uh, at least in some way, shape, or form, even if it's just one day a week where I'm working from home or working remotely mm-hmm. somewhere. Um, you know, as soon as you see a dip in productivity, of course, it's all, all bets are yeah. off. Everyone's coming back. It'll be just like it was, you know, two years ago. Yeah, how can you measure productivity? I mean, most of the people that I manage, almost all the people I manage are salespeople, right? And salespeople have yeah. very defined productivity metrics. Yep. And uh, and so that's the you know the joke I have. I, I had someone complain that one of my people was spending too much time on the golf course, and I said, well, have you seen their numbers? Maybe you should golf more. <laughs> you know, it, yeah, it's exactly. I, I'm not terribly worried about where they're at if, if right. the productivity number's there. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing to watch is the labor market. I mean, the labor market is so tight right now. And yeah. and I think, you know, employers have to be really thoughtful about uh, providing mm-hmm. their employees the, the, the benefits that they want, which may very well be yeah. some work from home ability. Yeah. You know, it's going to, so one of the interesting litmus tests on this, and it's a bit of a tangent, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up. The JP Morgan CEO, Um, said the other day that remote workers are basically going to have to come back in the office by fall. Just no ifs, ands, or buts. He understands there are going to be times when people are going to be needing to work outside the office, Mm -hmm. but you know what? 90%, 80%, 90%, some high number, you're going to need to be back in the office, or you're going to end up, quote-unquote, paying the price. I don't know what that means. Didn't seem that he meant that we're going to start firing people. Um, but, But it's an interesting attitude to take, um, especially right now. Yeah. You know, it'll be interesting to see what the blowback is on that, if any. Yeah. I mean, Jamie Dimon's a fascinating guy, and, and I believe he's probably the mm-hmm. best banker in the world. So um, right. I'm in no way probably qualified to critique his thoughts, but it, it does seem to be a little bit of an interesting take. Um, and But again, I think it's also important to remember that I think some of the things we're experiencing right now in Utah – in terms of labor market and economic growth are not being experienced in other places as well. Oh, so, absolutely. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, what we, he may be making a decision or a comment for a much larger kind of geographic swath yeah. where, where he might have a little more flexibility to make that comment. Right. Yeah. As opposed to us. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, um, you know, let's sort of go back and talk a little bit about construction because one of the things that we're starting to hear, well, th- so there's some interesting things that go on in Utah in particular. You know, one of the things we talked about in the last podcast was that the pandemic was great for the airport, mm-hmm. right? And that we were able to actually get the airport done just slightly ahead of schedule, um, just a little bit under budget because we weren't having to work around all the travelers. Yeah. So that was fantastic. That labor market rolls off. Majority of those folks already have jobs, mm-hmm. right? And there are a number of big projects, right? We've got Inland Port. You know, we're going to have that whole point of the mountain development. Um, you know, so things are looking pretty bright there from the ability to get people to work. Um, but we're also hearing about difficulty in the supply chain. Yeah. Right? So how do we think about those two things next to each other? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... <laughs> I think you think about them in the sense that if you're looking at a real estate construction project, it's going to probably cost more than you're planning on mm-hmm. and uh, take longer than you think it will. Um, which, as you mentioned, there's pros to that. There's plenty of people at work. Um, but the, the supply chain issues, I mean, commodity risk is always an issue uh, mm-hmm. when you're looking at a construction product, but project. But right now it seems to be even elevated. Um, yeah. A couple of kind of oddball things that, that uh, you know, you and I talked the other day that we want to quit talking about the pandemic so much, but mm-hmm. the fact of the matter is it's it's what's impacting a lot of these things, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, for whatever reason, the, the pandemic made a lot of people hesitant to sell their homes. Mm-hmm. And so there's there's kind of a historically low number of existing homes for sale. Well, people still need homes and are moving, and mm-hmm. so that drives them all to construction, right? Right. And so there's this spike in construction materials on the housing side. Um, but construction materials for houses are largely construction materials for mm-hmm. commercial buildings too. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of overlap there. So you just see this, this spike. And then on the supply side, um, you know, they weren't really ready for a spike. There's a lot of these lumber mills that are older and, and have had issues with equipment and shutdowns, obviously COVID related, uh, protocols and spacing and that those types of things have decreased output. And then a couple of oddball things, some environmental issues, things like beetles impacting the supply of lumber um, yeah. or, or cold weather 
in Dallas, unusually cold weather. What was that in January, February? They uh-huh. had that, that really, really cold storm that actually uh, hurt um, some of these supplies. And so mm-hmm. you just have this spike in demand with a lot of different things kind of uh, impacting supply. Yeah. And so you've seen commodity prices just, just raise through the roof. Um, and then, you know, I think the final factor there is, you know, we, we're starting to see inflation data come in, mm-hmm. and in, inflation is unexpectedly high. Um, so you're starting to hear talk of interest rates raising. Um, right. At first it was in 2023, and then this week we've heard as early as 2022. Right. Um, and if, quite frankly, if the data continues, you may see rates raise earlier than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so inflation obviously puts – you know, drive some of this commodity risk as well. And so we're going to need to, to really watch that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a big issue right now. If you're looking at a construction project, you're going to typically see your contractor want to push pretty hard for a cost plus type of contract, mm-hmm. um, meaning that, you know, the, the only thing that's kind of fixed is their fee, but shifting that commodity risk back to mm-hmm. the, to the uh, you know, the owner of the project. And so, uh, you know, I think, there are great opportunities now, but I think you need to be a little bit prepared that one, your project might cost a little more. Right. Uh, you probably need to think through some liquidity to make sure you've got capital to address some mm-hmm. of this variability. And then your project, you probably ought to have a plan that it might take a little bit longer than you're planning on just yeah. given all these dynamics. Yeah. So one of the interesting impacts on this, um, by the way, just in some conversations that I've had with, with homeowners, as well as with a few folks that I know that are in the, in the, the home building business mm-hmm is that um, you're seeing this ripple through impact where remodels are becoming really adversely impacted. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily that you, it's, it's not as much the supply chain as it is the labor market, yep. right? Your good home builders, your good contractors, they've got all they can handle building homes. Yeah, yeah no, so anecdotally, I'm finishing my basement. Uh, right. Speaking of remodels, yeah, and, and, and no, you're you're totally seeing that that the, the one-off job, um, or the contractor that can only supply supply a few jobs a year. You know, we are hearing that that it's getting pretty tough for those folks. Mm-hmm. That that uh, a lot of not only not only labor, but really even from the supply side, mm-hmm. um, a lot of people are prioritizing uh, larger contractors who they know have repeat business, yeah. um, who really kind of drive these trades and these suppliers. Mm-hmm. You know year to year. And so that it's for sure a challenge as you look at a remodel that's typically either being generaled by the homeowner um, yeah. or the business owner in the case of a business mm-hmm. remodel or or a small contractor. Uh, there are definite challenges that way on both the labor and the supply side. Yeah. 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 We, uh, we're, so- we're expecting my basement to be done in 2024. Okay. No, that's good to know. <laughs> that's good to know. I might need to actually then take your contractors up to my house. Um, yeah, I won't go on and on and talk about that because my wife listens to this. I'll get in a lot of trouble <laughs> for having that conversation. We're just going to have to come to this space to have the band room. So. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's exactly what we're going to have to do. Yeah. yeah, have to hide in here or yeah, keep me out of trouble. Let, let's talk a little bit about real estate, not building, right? But but land, um, buying existing buildings, et cetera, and sort of talk about what that market looks like. And, and maybe we can actually start with talking about the different types of, of loan products that are available to people who are interested in uh, either making an investment or in, you know, acquiring real estate, real estate so they can build, you know, put a building on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. I mean, on the commercial side, it's a question that most business owners face at one time or another is, is it worth making a real estate investment? Is it worth diverting mm-hmm. some of my capital uh, into a, a long-term fixed asset like, like real estate? Yeah. And, uh, and there are lots of different ways to look at and think through that. Um, you know, generally speaking, if your business is fairly stable, uh, if you're not planning a real quick sell or exit from your business, um, owning real estate tends to make a lot of sense. There's mm-hmm. some tax benefit to it. There's some, some stability to it that's, that's really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and, it, and it usually is an asset that, you know, can kind of stabilize returns and you can kind of get some stable returns, you know, out of that over the long run. Yeah. And so, you know, it's a decision that a lot of businesses really ultimately want to make that. Now, sometimes they go into that and start to say, okay, well, maybe I should get a building that's twice as big as what I need. And then I can use the rent. I'll, I'll rent out mm. the other half and use that to lower, you know, my real estate cost. And, 
And that can be a great option. We've seen that work really, really well for clients. Uh, we've also seen it, you know, become a challenge. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I was just thinking with a 17% office vacancy yeah. rate, you're probably, that's probably not necessarily the best course of action right now. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, just to use current data, if, if you use that uh, and went out and, and bought a bigger warehouse building than you needed mm -hmm. and could, well, you'd, you'd probably be in great shape and you probably have a really nice offset to your real estate expense sure. with, with leasing it out. But if you went out a couple of years ago and, and kind of speculated on just straight office space, you know, you could have something on your hands that's actually costing you more money than, mm -hmm. than this kind of rebate you were hoping to get from your, from yeah. your real estate. Yeah. So, you know, those are things just to think through what's your risk appetite, what's the market doing, and, and, and you want to analyze that. Um, you know, typically, if you are looking at owning a business and, and you're going to primarily occupy that business or that building with, with the business that you own, there are some pretty neat programs. Mm -hmm. uh, most people have heard the term SBA, Small Business Administration. Yep. Um, but they exist to help businesses um, be able to purchase real estate. Among They, they do other loan types as well. But uh, they got a couple pretty unique programs that, that can allow businesses to get into a, a real estate uh, project for 10% mm -hmm. sometimes, as low as 10% down. Uh, which typically you're talking kind of 20 to 30 percent down as a typical down payment for commercial real estate. Um, you know, these some of these programs can get you in with as little as 10 percent down. But again, mm -hmm. those are targeted to small to medium businesses who are yeah. primarily occupying their their building, and they're not they're not using it for investment opportunity. Right. Uh, you can carve out a little bit for some investment, but the primary use needs to be uh, the 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 owner of the business also occupying the building. Yeah. So, um, you know, there, there's there's a couple items there. I mean, this is the topic where I can sit and talk about commercial loans for hours, and someone will need to throw something at me to get me to stop. But uh, well, eventually the camera batteries will go, it, it and just then runs we'll, out. Yeah, that's just yeah, and that's how yeah. I know. Yeah, and then it's time. Yeah, when I look up and everyone's gone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a couple things to, to to be mindful of. You know, on the construction side again, we talked a little bit about right now current pricing. I think you want to be thoughtful. Um, you know, about whether you've got the liquidity position and, mm -hmm. and in order to enter a construction project. Uh, that said, it, it could be a good time. And, and you could probably find some deals on office space if you're looking to, mm -hmm. to expand that way. Or if you're a, a retail business, I mean, one of the things we didn't talk about, and one of the reasons retail did okay is we do have a lot of these kind of home care, hobby type businesses that um, just thrived, right? Um, I yeah. actually went to a bike shop this morning uh, my son and I got into mountain biking during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And there's a million people like us that were like, okay, we need something to do with our free time. Right. What about mountain biking? You walk into that mountain biking store, there's a million people in there. There's like 12 bikes on the shelf because they can't mm -hmm. keep them in stock. Um, you know, and so if, if you've got a retail business that's thriving, then you could have some really good opportunities to, to pick up space. Yeah. And, and the other thing you may want to think about, rates are low. It could be a time to get in with, with rates being low. Um and as of right now, I mean, you know, as it looks like costs are escalating, maybe it's a good time to get in and, and kind of lock in some prices, both right. on your rate and, and kind of on the commodity side, if you think it's going to continue in the, in the long term. Yeah, yeah. You know, so at the bank, we have the, the investment real estate uh, team, mm -hmm. right? Talk a little bit about, about what they're doing um, and the types of, of – clients that they're talking with. Yeah, and, and we do a lot of commercial real estate at the bank. So we do have one team that, that's dedicated to larger investment projects. Right. Um, in the past, historically, we kind of shied away from some of these bigger deals. And so we, you know, we've set up um, a team where we have you know, some real expertise there. Mm. And, and so we're willing to do a few larger projects mm -hmm. just because we got some expertise looking at it day in and day out. You know, that said, though, we, we are seeing, um, we, we do a lot of real estate all throughout the footprint. Right. And, and just, um, but maybe not of the size that that, that specific team mm -hmm. does. So um, typically, again, we're seeing really high demand. I mean, it, it's a lot of these things we've talked about. We're seeing right. extremely high demand for the warehouse, for multifamily, mm -hmm. a ton of new projects coming online. Um, we're seeing every one of these developers be nervous about... Uh, uh, supply costs. Um, yeah. So we're, yeah. we're we're thinking through strategies of 
of how do we pre-order but still maintain the integrity of the loan and mm -hmm. you know because typically on a construction loan um you bring in your supply you get it installed we send an inspector out and we pay you you know the bank disperses off that loan once all that right. has been provided right right well now we're having people want to take advantage to lock in prices today because two months from now prices are so much higher mm -hmm. and so we're having these issues of how do we solve that problem and 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 try to help lock in those prices without you know putting the bank in a vulnerable spot of paying mm -hmm. for things that that aren't there and, yeah. and so typically we're looking at pre-buying and then storing them in you know say bonded warehouses or things mm -hmm. so we still at least know that the raw supply is somewhere and and safe and protected right right so th those are the big issues that, that we're dealing with now um but again generally uh economy is pretty positive people are pretty optimistic you do have lots of clients looking for space lots of clients that are growing mm -hmm. and and looking for um new space and 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 ways to expand their business so. yeah yeah. Let's, it, and it might be a little, I don't know, we might be treading on some sacred ground here or something as, <laughs> as we talk about it, but let, let's chat a little bit about, um, about uh, multifamily housing. Okay. Right. You know, I mean, I think that there are, you're right, there are people that are kind of surprised that that falls under uh, commercial building. Stop and think about it. Makes sense mm -hmm. that, it, that it would. Um, you know, as we were looking at some of the data earlier today, multifamily is still lagging behind single-family homes, uh, with the exception of Salt Lake County. Right. Um, do we think, and I, I know we're sort of looking at the crystal ball here, but do we think that that's a trend that's going to continue? It, it feels a little out of sync with some of the shifting demographics that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just, I'm curious what your thinking is. Yeah. Um, it is interesting, and it'll be interesting to see how quick some of these demographics do shift. Um, you know, as a general rule, this still is the West. We tend to like space. We tend to like mm -hmm. cars. Um, we tend to like to grow a garden and, and different things. There is that right. kind of yep. open, big sky, open mm -hmm. kind of mentality and culture here, right? Yeah. And so, and, and that still exists. Now, I think it doesn't exist to the same degree. Um, and then the other thing you've really got to think through is, is prices. I mean, right. we've, we've kind of talked a little bit about that. And, and again, to go anecdotal, I mean, you know, I, I live in a, it's a home that was built by a track builder. It, it's, it's on a, you know, a quarter acre lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's in a nice town, but it's not in, in a posh town mm -hmm. by any means. And we're seeing home prices in our neighborhood start to reach that like eight hundred thousand mark for, yeah. for pretty kind of regular suburban homes, and you start to look at that and just say that's going to be out of reach for mm -hmm. a lot of people that live here, and and so we need to start being really thoughtful of how do we provide housing uh, mm -hmm. to people that that work here and live here, and so I I, I do think you know th there is always a balance um, you know. Deve developers often will want to overdevelop multifamily, small footprint, because the cost mm -hmm. per square foot goes up when they do that, right? It, there's a profit yeah. incentive for them to yeah. do that. Um, and, and often you're going to have cities sometimes that are unrealistic about what are the changing demographics mm -hmm. and, you know, cities that think everyone wants a, you know, a half acre lot and, and a goat in their backyard or whatever. Right. And, and obviously that's changing as well. So, you do have these two kind of competing interests. Um, I do think, generally speaking, um, you know, the kind of more suburban counties have probably mm -hmm. lagged a little bit with that insight. Um, you are having developers putting more and more pressure on for these suburban counties to mm -hmm. start to grapple with this idea of, of more dense housing because they have to. I mean, and that's yeah. what, again, you look at apartment costs downtown Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. they're not terribly affordable. And so you, you, you start seeing developers start doing things like uh, working on some micro multifamily, you know, the, yeah. these kind of three to 400 square foot apartments mm -hmm. uh, to deliver affordable product downtown. Um, the other thing that you'll start to see is developers really starting to push suburban areas because your land cost comes down and now you right. can deliver uh, a housing product that's a little more affordable. So, yeah. Uh, I think the other thing that'll be super interesting is it's the work from home discussion. I mean, you're, you're yeah. going to have to see multifamily uh, developments kind of grapple with that. And do you provide that as an amenity or do you start building in 
work from home, mm -hmm. you know, little closets or whatever that can be kind of multifunctional work from home spaces. Yeah. So I, I think there's some kind of fun things to watch there too. The other one is that dog ownership is way, way up. And, you know, historically apartments were kind of mm -hmm. like no pets. And <laughs> exactly. you're, you're exactly. starting to see these apartment projects become pet friendly and provide uh -huh. pet amenities. And it, it, it's necessary in order to, yeah. to attract the top clients. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, Anyway, a few, a few trends that we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that latter one in particular, uh, of course, near and dear to my heart, but, you know, with the number of dog adoptions that took place, or pet adoptions mm -hmm. in general, right, dogs and cats, and the, you know, with the occasional rabbit or guinea pig, um, <laughs> you know, that, that took place over the last year. And there was a fear that a lot of those animals would be returned, and, and most of the adoption organizations are not seeing that, oh, which, which is great for the pets. Um, but yeah, it is yeah. going to kind of change the you know the types of, of dwellings that people are going to be looking for. Yeah, uh, and and you know for the landlords and the owners to think differently about how they're going to be able to provide for for the folks that are the animal yeah. owners. No, we've seen two or three uh, multifamily projects with with very specific, particularly. Dogs seem to be the big one where you're seeing the most growth, but very targeted mm -hmm. uh, dog-focused amenities. Yeah, yeah, a little off-leash you know, off area and, yep. and everything. Yeah, really, really interesting stuff. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. Um, you know, you talk about the, the, the locations as well and some of these suburban counties, and, and it's, it's interesting. You know, most I think most people kind of think about that growth happening north-south. You know, the corridors sort of heading from... You could almost say really as far north as Layton all the way down to Provo. Um, but, you know, there is this desire to, or for people, especially that, that work in Salt Lake County, to be able to push east, or I'm, I'm sorry, west, west, and, you know, Tooele County. And that's one that we keep hearing about as sort of poised for explosive growth. Mm -hmm. Or you hear about um, smaller towns like Price, you know, that have made a real investment in infrastructure. And they could become kind of a, a quote-unquote, bedroom community for Lehigh, right, because it's only an hour or so away. Right. Uh, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that growth ends up getting spread about. Yeah, I mean, I'd still say that your primary, and, and I'd go north of Leighton, I'd go Ogden, um, some really amazing development. Uh, that yeah, true, Ogden, that's true. You know, but yeah. kind of Ogden, the Spanish Fork, is kind of the core. Mm -hmm. But you are seeing that push further north and south, and then, as your point, west. East, obviously, there's a geographic uh, boundary with the mountains, but then you mm -hmm. look at the Wasatch back, and, oh, yeah. and you're experiencing very si very similar growth rates. And a lot of this out-of-state immigration is, is moving to the Wasatch back. Yeah. Um, so you're just seeing really high, uh, high spikes in, in growth there as well. So, you, you know, I, I do think those western communities, whether it's Tooele, whether it's Eagle Mountain in Utah County, whether mm -hmm. it's the kind of Syracuse area yeah. in Davis County, um, th those communities have been around for a long, long time. Right. They, they provide a great, you know, kind of outlet and resource. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you do see at times where prices start to escalate. Um, you know, people move further and further mm -hmm. west. Again, it's just economics driving down land costs. Yeah. Um, and so I, th I think right now you're going to see that quite a bit. I do think you'll see uh, a lot of growth in, in those western communities because prices are so high. Yeah. Um, and there's a there's a group in town that provides us a lot of this data. Um, am I allowed to say names? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, of course. It, it yeah. used to be Metro study, study. Now I believe they go by Zonda, and, and they provide mm -hmm. it. And so I'm I'm stealing this line from them, but you know, they kind of talk about those communities as the the drive till you qualify, right? And mm -hmm. so you want to buy a home, and you, you kind of keep driving west, and yeah. and the prices come down, and eventually you get to where uh, there's a point that works yeah. well for for you and your situation, and and so I, I think we will see. Uh, a lot of demand there. Mm -hmm. The more rural ones, uh, again, we're getting a lot of reports, places like you mentioned Price, uh, San Pete County, mm -hmm. uh, seeing a ton of migration. And again, as, as people feel comfortable working from home. So if you were to work in, say, you know, a Lehigh or a Provo area, and you only had to be in the office one day a week, you could easily facilitate that from Price mm -hmm. or from, you know, Mount Pleasant or some of these places. Yeah. Um, and so we are starting to see some pressure in those more rural communities, more growth, more construction, mm -hmm. um, because I do think uh, I, I do think the work from home magic is starting to mm -hmm. to show there. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then of course, the thing that comes along with that conversation, and it's a little you know, it's a little beyond our 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 scope for today. But 
you know, then we have to start to think about, well, then how do we manage the infrastructure? You know, how do we manage the roads? How do we manage the light rail? How do we keep the commuters from, you know, going crazy? Um, you know, how do you prevent a Seattle, right? Is, you know, which, which, which I've said on this podcast before, right? You yeah. know, how do we prevent Utah from becoming Seattle in that regard? And I don't know that you do. I mean, I, that's, that's actually the comparison I make is I think if you look forward, you know, and, and Natalie and her team, again, have great data on this, mm -hmm. but... You know, I, I don't know that I see us becoming a San Francisco. Um, yeah. But I could see Utah starting to look a lot like Seattle in the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, now, to your point, there's smart people thinking about things. And, can, and mm -hmm. from an infrastructure standpoint, can we be proactive? If we know that kind of growth is coming, can we invest in infrastructure? Can we be thoughtful mm -hmm. about, you know, pollution and these types of things and, and create a, a really workable, you know, large metro area? You know, certainly I believe it's possible. I, I think yeah. we've got I, – I really think we have great leadership in this state that's uh, pretty forward-thinking and, mm -hmm. and looking at a lot of these and, and how do we tackle. Um, I mean, it's, it's a great problem. People want to be here, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But one of the jokes that we've had, we may have even talked about this, you know, they can't build new canyons. Right. Um, and, and so – you're seeing new, more pressure on the canyons. And a lot of the reason people move uh -huh. here is, is the outdoor recreation experiences, yep. right? So, you know, how do we be thoughtful there? There's pretty low-cost infrastructure things you can do in the canyons to make them usable for more people. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're going to have to be thoughtful about a lot of those things and, and how, do we, how do we best use our natural resources yeah. um, and, and provide the best experience that we can yeah. for our residents. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, what other sort of interesting insights have you, you know, have you picked up with respect to commercial building, commercial lending, you know, just or over, you know, the overall environment um, over the course of the last few months? Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe the last few months or maybe even just the last several years of, of kind of doing this. Yeah, true, you know, yeah. I, I yeah. think there are, again, I think it's really fascinating to sit down and work with a business. And this is where, a, you know, a, a great banker can be a, a, a resource to you. But you know, one of the things I've really learned is how valuable that can be. And, mm -hmm. and if you're really thoughtful and deliberate about, you know, I need to build a building. Well, why do I need to build a building? And again, if you have a business that, that is growing really quickly um, and every dollar of equity in your business, you're getting a 50% return on, well, maybe pulling some of that equity out and buying real estate that you're going to get an 8 to 12% return on is not a great idea, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I think, to me, that's just one of, those, one of the things that's been powerful to me is just seeing really great bankers sit down with clients and really smart clients sit down with, with good bankers and just work through some of these things. Um, and, in, and in my experience, if you are thoughtful and deliberate about that, you end up with a, with a great situation almost all the time, right? Yeah. And where we tend to get in a little bit of trouble is is where we start to get hurried or, or not not very thoughtful uh, about about this process. So mm -hmm. to me, it's always, you know, you always want to be thinking about your capital position in your business. Um, you know, equity is the thing that solves so many problems. It helps you through downturns. It helps mm -hmm. you grow in good times, and it helps you survive in bad times. And just being really thoughtful about how you deploy that equity. And, and if you get spread too thin and there's a challenging time, you know, that's where folks can get hurt. So yeah. that would be an, an insight over, you mm -hmm. know, a long period of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I've, I've seen really great companies and really great bankers sit down and make a lot of really great decisions that, mm -hmm. that benefit everybody. Yeah. You know, one of the, just to, to build on that for a second, and it's sort of in the form of a question, but, you know, I know that we do have bankers that work with some of our clients as their, you know, as their equity position might start to start to slip a little bit and talk about things like recapitalization mm -hmm. or, you know, shift from a, an equipment ownership model to an equipment leasing model and, and things like that. Um, so at, how do those conversations begin to come up? You know, if I'm the, if I'm the banker, how am I starting to, to broach that discussion? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and that's, uh, you know, I think the big thing is just helping. A lot of times, I love and hate the phrase, the customer is always right, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I get where it comes from, and, and there's a lot of truth to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a lot of times, it's like, well, the customer is always right if you're certain that they've considered all the variables, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we can be pretty confident to have some of these conversations, to, to sit down with somebody and say, hey, 
you, you know, we're noticing that, yeah, your, your sales are way up, but your margins are actually down. Mm -hmm. which is actually compressing net profit and actually maybe causing your equity position to slip, at least as a percentage of your assets, right? Right. And, and, and so those are great conversations to sit down and say, okay, what's going on? Let's talk through this. Mm -hmm. um, is this a short-term issue? Did you have to lower prices because you entered a new market and you kind of have a teaser program going on and you're expecting those margins to increase over time? Um, but a lot of times I think, people can be a little bit afraid to kind of sit down and ask those questions. Sure. What I find is businesses love to answer those questions. Businesses uh -huh. love to talk about it. And a lot of times when you help them uncover something they hadn't thought of, they're extremely grateful and appreciative. Right. So just really having the confidence that you know your business, you know what you're talking mm -hmm. about, and uh, realizing that those conversations are value additive, that, yeah. that sitting down and, and asking hard questions and talking through what's going on in a business is a great way to add value. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really how we kind of encourage it is, is, you know, you can, you can sometimes look at these as, Oh, our, our credit people that make decisions have this question and we just, it's like, no, something's going on. Let's have the conversation. Yeah. Let's just yeah. chat about it. And a lot of times there's a great explanation. A lot of times there's a great solution. Mm -hmm. Um, well, let's just have the conversation. Yeah. That, yeah. That's how we No solve. judgment. Just, yeah. Yeah. That's how we fix things and solve things. So, yeah. you know, in my mind, I love it. I love to sit and look at a company's financial statements and say, okay, what's the story? Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and so if you're always looking at it from, okay, how do I just get this deal done? You know, I think that's less fulfilling and less value added than let's sit down and figure out the story mm -hmm. uh, because then we can actually make sure we're putting this together the very best way we can. And, and we might uncover some things and make some things known to the client that help them make better decisions. Yeah. Um, and everyone wants to make the best decision that they can. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, any other parting shots before we go to the, the piece of the uh, podcast that I didn't tell you we were going to do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know if there are, are any other <laughs> parting shots. I, you know, as we prepared for this, I sit and laugh because I'm like, are, 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 are folks going to listen to a podcast about commercial real estate? I love it. I could talk about it for three days, but uh, uh, you know, I do think it is. It's a topic that uh, really does touch more people than you think of. Yeah. Um, most people's jobs tie into this topic somehow. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, I, I just would say, you know, the parting shot is be mindful and thoughtful of the spaces around you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as an employee, I bet you your boss would be pretty excited if you were to come in and say, hey, I have some ideas about our space and how we could better utilize this or how we could work with, uh, you know, employees that want a flex schedule. So I just say, hey, yeah. be, be mindful of this stuff. Um, it, it might sound like something that doesn't touch your life, but as you really start to think about it, it, it probably touches your life more than you might think. Yeah. Well, and uh, yeah, I agree with that. And, and, and it not only that, but it, I mean, it has impact across the entire state, right? There's a ripple effect here that one way or another, you know, every individual in the state's going to get touched by it in some way, shape, yeah. or form. Yeah. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, so awareness is important. And, and even if it doesn't directly, I mean, again, real estate tends to drive the economy. Yeah. And where it goes, it just has such a, a multiplying effect on jobs mm -hmm. and services that are needed in, in the economy as a whole. All right. So, lightning round. Um, just a set of questions, answer off the top of your head, um, we'll, and we'll see where it goes. Sometimes it gets really interesting. Uh, so question number one, what books are currently sitting on your nightstand? Uh, I'm embarrassed to say um, I haven't been reading a lot lately. Um, I used to read primarily via, you know, Audible, the the, yeah. the audio book. Yep. And I used to commute from American Fork to Draper, and it was mm -hmm. awesome. So between the, I had about an hour every day. Mm -hmm. I now commute from American Fork to American Fork. I don't work from home. My office is just in American Fork. Right. And so my commute is like five minutes. Sometimes if uh -huh. I miss the light, it's six minutes. Hmm. That's and, tough. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I actually probably do podcasts more than uh -huh. books right now. Uh, I'm way into Bloomberg's Masters of Business podcast, uh -huh. uh, The Accidental Creative. Um, I really enjoy... Um, I like Gladwell's podcast. Yeah, yeah. But I would say that's probably filling the niche right now that, that mm -hmm. reading um, mm -hmm. has traditionally filled. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and more and more podcasts do that too. Yeah, yeah. There's some. I mean, yeah. There's some awesome. I have too much. Yeah, yeah. Just you too almost, much. Where do you yeah. start? Yeah. So much great content. Exactly. All right. 
Generally, we ask what book would you recommend for really good escapist fare, but let's actually shift that a little bit, okay. knowing that the podcasts are more of a, you know, more of a focus for you right now. What escapist podcast would you recommend to everybody listening? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Broken Record by Gladwell is uh-huh. probably my favorite. Okay. Um, because it is, I mean, he's got the the history one, right? Uh, I can't think of the name of it right now, but... Uh, hmm. I know the one you're talking about. It's yeah, a little more... I mean, it, it's good, too. It's kind of an escapist one, but but I love I love music. Uh, you right. know, I've alluded to it a couple of times. We're in this cool space with guitars and drums and basses. And, yeah. And so to have them talk about, uh, um, you know, bands and different albums and kind of go yeah. deep is pretty amazing. I remember just recently, or within the last year, they did one on Tom Petty's Wildflowers album uh-huh. and just went really, really deep. And uh, so I typically something involving music, yeah. um, and, and that's probably the, the most common one right now. Awesome. That's really awesome. Um, bingeable TV shows. I mean, yeah. everybody talks about the last year, you know, diving in and binging like crazy. What did, what did you and the family discover? Yeah, so um, a couple of shows we've, we've gotten into. One, I, I, uh, you've probably heard this idea of habit bundling. Uh-huh. And, and I've done that in my life by when I work out in the mornings, I allow myself to watch old sitcoms. I just, sure. I think old sitcoms are great. So I, I'm just, uh, I'm almost done with Seinfeld. And I've been watching that the last few months. And, yeah. and I've, I've seen it before, but just was fun to revisit. But, but you can never watch it too many times. Never yeah. watch it too many times. <laughs> uh, a couple ones that we really got into family-wise, uh, uh, Cobra Kai. Uh, uh-huh. I've got three sons that just love Cobra Kai. Uh my wife and I really got into Convenience Kim. Kim's Convenience. Yeah, Kim's Convenience, yep. So funny. Yeah. Um, so we like that. Um, one I didn't watch with the family, and, and I struggle to sometimes recommend it because the language is a little tough, but Ted Lasso was probably the favorite show that I found. Oh, yeah. Uh, just so good and yeah. so heartwarming. And I just love that story, and I love I love the characters in yeah. that. So uh, there's, there's three that we... Uh, uh, that we watched nice. during the pandemic. Nice. I so I will recommend to you um, to go go and find in a, a Entertainment Week online. Okay. Um, or Entertainment Magazine, whatever it is. They do a whole. Uh, it's like a three or four page spread on how Ted Lasso came to be. Oh, really? And it's really yeah, and it, it goes way beyond the uh, the TV commercials. Because I remember the did. commercials right. right when NBC started broadcasting. Yeah, broadcasting soccer. soccer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it, it started before that. Okay. It's an interesting, it's kind of an interesting was story. Was it all Sudeikis's to start, or? Well, no, so the, so the short story, and I, I hope this doesn't, I don't think it'll offend anybody, because I'm just paraphrasing from the article. So what happened is the guy that plays Coach Beard, I hope everybody has seen, the, has seen Ted Lasso. Um, so the guy that plays Coach Beard was living in Amsterdam and was working with an improv troupe in Amsterdam. Okay. Sudeikis came and visited him, and this is 2002, 2003, and, uh, as, uh, and, and did some work with him and all. And as the, the guy that plays Beard says, you know, one day we didn't have anything to do, so we went and took mushrooms, as one does in Amsterdam when you don't have anything <laughs> to do, and they started brainstorming this idea for a soccer uh, TV show or movie because um, the guy that plays Beard really got into soccer. Okay. And one thing led to another, and they ended up sort of creating Ted Lasso and, and some of the rest of the this characters. Concept. Yeah. How cool. Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's kind of like, wow. And it just kind of sat there for a while and then eventually got developed in the commercials and the show. And yeah. 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 And it's a cool article. It's cool. If I can find a link, I'll send yeah, it to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, text it to me. Cool. Um, you already mentioned one of these, but I'm going to ask, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask anyway. Um, any new hobbies that you all picked up? Yeah, from last year, a, a couple of them, and again, I'm just. We mentioned that this in, in migration to Utah. One mm-hmm. of the things that, that attracts people is the the natural resources and the outdoor recreation. Yeah. So, um, I did buy a mountain bike about three months ago, and I, one of my sons and I are getting into that. Um, I went for a mountain bike ride this morning. I think it's just ridiculously fun. It is so fun yeah, cool. to be up there and, and navigate those trails. And so, yeah, I, I've picked that up. Um, I've been an amateur, you know, guitarist for a long, long time, yeah. and I'm still very much an amateur guitarist. But I, I do think uh, the pandemic did probably allow a little more time to maybe practice that. Mm-hmm. So, kind of one quirky one. We happened to live right by a disc golf course, and I'd never even heard of it. And uh, we got a neighbor that was way into it, and you know, again, kind of last March, April, where it's just how do you keep kids entertained? Uh-huh. 
And I got a 17 year old boy that kind of caught on to that and has become really, really good at it. So uh, we'll wander out and do that once in a while. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot less expensive than, than regular golf. That, that's the great thing about it, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, I mean, you can get started with like a $25 investment, but if you, yeah. like, if you're way into it, you can spend maybe a couple hundred bucks and then, like, it's free from that point yeah, forward. Yeah. Because you need special Frisbees or how to. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a whole craft around it. I mean, sure, you, you yeah. can get as fancy as you want to with it. But yeah, I mean, just like golf, there's different, different, yeah. you know, discs for, you know, distance and mid range and oh, short well. range and, and ones that have different flight patterns and do different things. So yeah, that's cool. I didn't, I had no idea. Oh, yeah, you can but, totally geek out. All right, now I might have to go and, and <laughs> do some more reading because we all know how I love to geek out. Yeah. Um, awesome. Um, any final parting thoughts, not on the business front or anything else you want to you want to share before we? I was really hoping when we filmed this, I could say go Jazz, but uh, I guess I'll leave it with go Utes. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan, thank you. It's always always a pleasure. I, I I actually said I actually I said to my wife yesterday it's it's actually one of the the high, one of the highlights of my week is when you and I get to do our oh, okay. our, our our touch bases just because yeah. we do tend to wander off into the. You know, in all kinds of different topics, it's always a lot of fun. So thank you very much yeah. for the, the time today. No, the feeling's mutual. And with your Seattle background, it's, you know, it, I've got a water bottle that's got, you know, Eddie Vedder and Pearl Jam stickers all oh, over yeah. it. Oh, yeah. I've and seen that. You and I can yeah. get uh, lost in the in the weeds talking yeah. about Seattle grunge rock. So. And it's a fun time. And it's totally worth it. So... And there we have it. Uh, it's been great looking into all things commercial real estate and the uh, commercial lending climate here in Utah. Ryan... Thank you again. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Stan. It was, it's been a blast. All right. For everyone else, I want to thank you for listening to Alta Banking. And until next time, make sure to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Pandora, or Google Podcast. We'll talk to you next time.